Will any of Gonzaga's young stars get drafted in 2024? Could any of them step into the starting lineup? And could Gonzaga be part of Big East expansion westward? All of that and more on today's mailbag episode of the Locked on Zags podcast. You are Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Andy Patton, and today's episode of the Locked On Zags podcast is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. It is Mailbag Monday, folks. Today here, a reminder for those of you who want to get involved in Mailbag Monday, well, we're not using Twitter as much, or I suppose X these days as we have historically. So the best ways to get involved in Mailbag Monday would be to email me, andypatton 13 at gmail.com. You can also join our Discord channel. Most of the questions for today came through Discord. There is a link at the bottom of the show notes. Definitely click on that and you can join us there today. We got a lot of fun stuff to talk about today. We're going to get right into it. This first question does come from David on our Discord channel who says, who is most likely to get selected in the 2024 NBA draft out of Adams, Krajnovich, and Yo? Same question for 2025. Yes, let's talk some young Zags. I think that's been the most exciting development of the offseason. It's kind of felt like the offseason has been in multiple waves. We had a, an exodus of players early in the offseason, some panic, some fear kind of coming in at that time. And then we had an influx of veteran transfers coming in. You add Nemhard and EK at the same time. Steel Venters had come just shortly before that. And then there was kind of a quiet period in the offseason. And then we got that influx of youth. We got Marcus Adams Jr. decommits from Kansas, joins Gonzaga for the upcoming season. Then the Zags go out and add Croatian guard Luka Krajnovic to the roster as well. Of course, June Sakio was already on the roster. He joined the team last year in around uh, January, the start of the second semester. Uh, all three of these guys potentially could have roles next year. Very difficult to kind of project where it all is going to look. If I had to guess, if I was told that one of these players is getting drafted in 2024, and I had to guess who it was, I would say June Sakio for a couple of reasons. One, Yo is 21, whereas Marcus Adams Jr. is should be in the graduating high school graduating class of 2024. He reclassified early, so he is very young for his age. So he's going to be a freshman next year. Yo's going to be a sophomore next year, but they're three to four years apart in age, in maturity, physical maturity, emotional maturity, all of that stuff. So to me, that gives Yo a pretty significant advantage over Adams. Krajnovich is between those two guys age-wise, but he has the experience of having played against professionals in Croatia. Mark Few, when he gave his press conference talking about the addition of Luka Krajnovich, he specifically mentioned Krajnovic's previous history playing professional basketball players in Croatia, 25, 28, 32-year-old men who he was going up against. So that certainly would help him be somebody who could be more prepared for the NBA at a younger age. But of course, all of this is irrelevant. It just depends on who plays more. I think Yo is going to be a part of the rotation. I think there's a chance that he plays big minutes, plays 25, 30 minutes per game. I really think that that's possible. It's hard for us to know. We haven't seen him practice with the team. We haven't seen the growth that we kind of are assuming that he is making as somebody who is learning the language, learning the culture, learning the offense, learning all that stuff. He's got a huge leg up having been in the program since January, whereas Krajnovis has been in the program for literally seven days, while Marcus Adams Jr. hasn't been here a whole lot longer than that. So that, to me, is a massive advantage for Yo, factoring in the age, factoring in the NBA prototype that Yo already has. He's 6'8". You know, I think we need to see what that outside shooting looks like, but he's a big, tough kid. He's a good rebounder. He did really well in the FIBA tournament. I don't know that I'm – I certainly don't know enough about him to say – what his NBA prospects look like at this point. But I feel fairly confident in saying that right now, 
if we're talking about the 2024 NBA draft, Yo is the most ready player out of that trio to potentially be selected. Once you get into 2025 and beyond, it gets a little bit murkier. It certainly depends what the roster looks like. Are Ryan Emhart and Nolan Hickman both coming back? Because that significantly lowers the upside of somebody like Luka Krajnovic. Does Steel Venters come back? Does Yo come back? If Yo leaves after this season, that opens up a huge spot for Marcus Adams Jr. to potentially play more minutes. If he does not, if he comes back and Steel Venters comes back, suddenly Adams is in a much more precarious spot. Doesn't mean he won't play at all. Certainly he could play some small ball four. We know Anton Watson will be out the door. Potentially Venters could slide down to the two. Adams could play more minutes at the three. There are a lot of things that could change to put him in a better position. Adams Jr. has a really high upside. The athleticism, the talent, what he did in high school puts him in a position to be a potentially like lottery caliber talent. I would be shocked if it happened this year because I don't think the playing time is there for him but I wouldn't be stunned to see it in 2025. So Yo, I think, has the best upside to get drafted this year. Adams Jr. has the best upside to get drafted eventually. I'm not as sure 2025. It might even be 2026 uh, if he's willing to stick around that long. Krajnovic, I just need to see more of him. He's a little bit undersized, which makes it tough to know what that looks like for him from an NBA perspective. Six foot four combo guards. You have to be dang near elite, elite in order to get in the NBA with that pro with that kind of build and frame. So I'm a little bit less optimistic about Krajinovich, not as a Gonzaga player, mind you. I think he'll be excellent in Gonzaga's system. I'm just not sure I see an NBA path as clear for him as I see it for the other two guys, at least. Next question here comes from Twitter, and I apologize. This tweet got lost in the shuffle. Twitter has been a bit more difficult to navigate. I saw this question. I wrote it down. I missed who it was from, so I apologize if you're the person who asked this question. I'm also paraphrasing the question, but effectively it says, is Steel Ventures a lock to be in the rotation next season after the team added Krasnovich and Adams? So I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say that, I and I've talked about this on the show, and I believe that this question was in response to me saying, here are the six players who are locked into a rotation spot next year, and one of those six players was Steel Venters, whereas Yo and Krajnovic and Adams are all guys I have just outside of being locks. I think at least one of those guys will be in the rotation, but I'm not sure how it's going to shake out. For Venters, the reasoning is fairly obvious. Mark Few loves veteran players. It almost doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. In the 20 plus years that Mark Few has been the head coach of this program, no matter the talent level, no matter the pedigree, the upside, the you know riskiness of playing the veteran guys, if Mark Few has an opportunity to play somebody who's been in college basketball over somebody who hasn't, he's going to play the player who has been in college basketball. For better or worse, I'm not necessarily saying that that is always the correct decision. I'm not sure if it's the correct decision with Steele and these other guys because I just haven't seen enough of them yet to really know. But I know that that's what Mark Few wants to do. Beyond that, I think there's another interesting wrinkle here that we've talked about a little bit with the Malachi Smiths, Rasir Boltons, and what it did for Hunter Salas and those guys, which is if you recruit a player, if you add a player in the transfer portal, presumably with certain promises – Mark Few didn't add Steel Ventures telling him, well, you know, we might add a couple of younger guys six months from now that are going to compete and take your playing time. Of course, he didn't say that. He didn't know that that was going to happen. But presumably, Steel was given some kind of assurance of like, you're going to be in our rotation. You're going to be a big time player. I doubt Mark Few makes ironclad promises to anybody. That doesn't seem like his style. But if you recruit players in the portal especially players from mid-majors coming up to a higher level like Steel, and then you recruit over them in the same off season and push them farther and farther down the depth chart. You run the risk of alienating potential future additions in the transfer portal. And it's a tough call because at the end of the day, it's a culture of competition. If Marcus Adams Jr. or Luka Krajnovic or Jun Sok Yo or some combination of all of those guys are better basketball players than Steel Venters, and are just more ready to contribute on day one, which I don't think is super likely because of the age and experience factor. But if it were the case, Mark Few would probably do it. 
But again, the next time a mid-major player or any transfer is looking to come to Gonzaga, they might say, ah, I'm going to wait or I'm going to look somewhere else because I'm not sure that that's going to work out for me. Malachi Smith wanted to start for Gonzaga. I don't have a ton of sources on this necessarily, and he adjusted to his, what, his role very well and seemed quite happy with it. But if multiple players are coming to your program with expectations of a certain role and aren't getting it, eventually that's going to cause you problems on the recruiting trail. Again, don't know the full situation with Steele here. I think he's going to be in the rotation because I think he's good enough to be in the rotation. But I do think that that kind of subplot is something to keep an eye on for Gonzaga in the recruiting world and the transfer portal world going forward. Well, could the Big East expand westward? And could Fox help ensure the Zags get added to that conference? All of that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. Because LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. It is so easy to create a free job post. And then you just add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. From there, simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and ultimately hire. And let's be honest, the right team member can have a positive and measurable impact on your business. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockedoncollege. That is linkedin.com slash lockedoncollege to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Folks, want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those everyday listeners on YouTube checking out the new Gonzaga flag that we got in the mail just a couple of days ago. We got more fun stuff coming your way later this week. We'll continue to talk conference realignment. We'll get some fun guests on the show to have a variety of different conversations as we get into the slower part of the college basketball offseason. For now, though, we're going to continue our Mailbag Monday conversation here with a question that came from Mike via Gmail. Mike said, what if the Big East added a Western U.S. member so that the conference could be split into two divisions? Mike then laid out his two divisions and asked me to respond to that. So the Big East Eastern Division would be UConn, Providence, St. John, Seton Hall, Georgetown, Villanova, Xavier. All of those teams, of course, are actual Big East members right now. And then he included one addition, which he said would either be St. Joe's or St. Peter's. And then in the Big East West Division, he has Gonzaga, Creighton, St. Mary, Santa Clara, Marquette, Butler, DePaul, and St. Louis. So that would be adding St. Louis, Santa Clara, St. Mary's, and Gonzaga. Those would be your four additions to the Western Division with your returning schools being Creighton, Marquette, Butler, and DePaul. And then, of course, on the East, seven returning schools and then either St. Joe's or St. Peter's. Uh, Initial response to this from me would be this. First of all, I think the Big East would somewhat dramatically prefer to add Dayton over either St. Joe's or St. Peter's. So I would replace those two schools. St. Peter's is not an option for the Big East at all. It's just not. They're not a big enough school. They don't have enough success. It's just, it's not an option. St. Joe's is a potential option, especially in the Philadelphia area. I think that that's a, a, a desirable market for them to be, but Dayton is just, light years better as a consistent men's basketball program. Uh, Not as big of a media market, but also not a super small media market. I think you could develop some actual rivalries. Dayton Xavier could be a good one. Uh, So I think that Dayton makes more sense. So I would, if this was going to be a big 16 that actually existed, a big East 16 team conference with eight teams in the West, eight teams in the East, I would think Dayton replaces St. Peter's or St. Joe's. And then the rest looks okay. I love this. I think this would be so great for Gonzaga. But I don't see it happening. I don't think the Big East is that, doesn't have that level of desire to expand westward. And while they, I think, should have interest in Gonzaga and probably to some extent do have interest in Gonzaga, I don't think expanding this significantly and having Uh, much more travel. And again, splitting the divisions helps with the travel. It makes it not as significant of an issue, but I don't think the Big East wants to 
quite honestly dilute their product by adding programs like even Dayton and St. Louis, who I think are very obvious Big East candidates right now. They don't make the conference significantly stronger. They lift up the bottom. They're both better than DePaul, better than Butler, better than Seton Hall has been lately. Uh, Dayton's a very good program, but they're still in the middle of the pack. St. Louis is below the middle of the pack. Uh, Gonzaga would be excellent. St. Mary's would be excellent from a basketball perspective. St. Mary's very, very small school, limited academic resources, not a huge reach for a fan base. I, I, I don't think St. Mary's is as desirable of a conference realignment team as many believe that they are, because while they have had good sustainable basketball success, they don't have anything else going for them, not in the way that Gonzaga does at least. Santa Clara is kind of a throwaway addition. I think they're the, the correct addition out of the WCC along with Gonzaga and St. Mary's. It could be San Francisco. It could be LMU. I think Santa Clara is probably the direction that the Big East would go in this theoretical, but I just don't see the Big East making this move. Now, having said that, the Big East probably needs to do something. Adapt or die is a phrase I've said multiple times on the podcast, not because I recently watched Moneyball, although it doesn't hurt that that's the, the case. But for, for the Big East, just saying, well, phew, UConn didn't leave. We're still at 11. We're good is probably not the right attitude to have. They do need to do something. And expanding westward and adding Gonzaga is definitely something I could see them doing or something that they, I could see them exploring and looking into and trying to figure out how to make it work. I just think that the conference is so good right now at men's basketball that adding programs that are not – most of the programs we're talking about adding here are below the halfway point in the Big East. Santa Clara is significantly below that. St. Louis is significantly below that. Dayton, if they were to add them, would be kind of right in the middle. St. Mary's and Gonzaga are better, but again, St. Mary's kind of drags you down a little bit from a resource perspective. Uh, the facilities are well below what the rest of the Big East Conference has. I mean, well below. Same with Santa Clara. So there's some, some concern there in terms of how this would work. But I'm going to tell you right now, Mike, I think this is insanely fun. And if the Big East could find a way to pull off something like this, it would be extremely fun. Two more questions to close out this segment, both of them coming from Jeff via Gmail, both regarding the Big East as well. Jeff says, in 2024, the Big East will start will start renegotiating a new TV or media deal with Fox that expires in 2025. Since Gonzaga is the only non-football program that provides added value that is not already in a power conference, what do you think about the prospects that Fox uses those negotiations to get Big East to expand and add Gonzaga? I agree with you. Jeff, that Gonzaga is the premier brand that's not in a power six right now and that the Big East makes a lot of sense. Fox doesn't really have the power to convince the Big East to do this. I could see Fox in an attempt to sway, to try to get Gonzaga basketball games on their network as opposed to on ESPN where they have been historically. I could see them attempting to entice the Big East with, hey, maybe we could boost this package a little bit, get you get you each year member schools a little bit more money if you were to go out and add Gonzaga. But again, each of those programs then have to up their travel budget, their travel costs, Gonzaga. This doesn't fix the issues for Gonzaga either. And I think that's a big part of it. The Big East is still going to be the, the presidents of the universities are still going to be who votes on conference realignment. Fox promising them a little bit more money may not change their minds in that conversation. And the Big East and Gonzaga is still going to have to be getting enough money from the Big East to offset their travel costs for all of their programs. Again, assuming the Big East is extending an entire invitation to Gonzaga. I'm, I think Fox does play a role here. And I know your, your follow-up question kind of gets into that a little bit more. So I'm going to go ahead and read that now and give a more full answer to the question. Just follow up question is as follows. The Big East is one of two conferences that Fox has broadcasting rights for basketball games, with the other conference being the Big 12. We know Fox was involved with the Big 12 and its discussions about potentially adding Gonzaga and UConn. Fox could prove to gain even more with Gonzaga being added to the Big East. For the past few years, Big 12 conference games have been on Wednesdays and Saturdays, while Big East conference games have been on Thursdays and Sundays. BYU, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado complete Fox's late window of Big 12 games. I would add Arizona State in there as well. While Fox could then use Gonzaga, Creighton, and Marquette to complete its late window of Big East games on Thursdays and Sundays. Sure seems like Gonzaga not going to the Big 12 could be Fox's best interest and make them the biggest winner in all of this should Gonzaga be added to the Big East. What do you think? My initial response to this is I just don't think Fox cares that much about their basketball branding. 
And maybe that's a mistake on Fox's part. Maybe that's me being more bitter about how much of this uh, conference realignment saga has been driven by football. And I don't think that these media markets and these media companies and these institutions are really paying a lot of attention to what it means from a basketball perspective. The point makes sense. The Big East adding Gonzaga to have some late games against Creighton or Marquette, or, or again, going back to Mike's segment, if, if the Big East were to get real weird and try to add some more West Coast schools, they could really dominate that market. And I think Fox would like that. I think they would want that. But this is just not that high on their priority list. It, it, they're focused more on the Big 12 football, and they're focused more on you know continuing to to fight with other conferences to get some some money there and to get some tv deals in those situations and i just don't think the college basketball element like the big east is not hurting fox right now like they're doing great they have a great relationship with the big east the the basketball in the big east is is so so good top to bottom would gonzaga be a cherry on top yes would fox being able to basically steal gonzaga from espn be a benefit to them yes I just don't think it's a big enough priority for them to really be focusing on it in a way that would really elicit any super immediate change. When the Big East and Fox go to negotiating tables, will Gonzaga come up as part of those conversations? Almost assuredly. And I think that they will have some serious conversations. And I think Gonzaga's consulting firm will get involved and find out ways of like, hey, how much money can we make from this? How can we potentially convince the Big East that this is a financially solvent, you know, strong decision for them to make? Like there's a lot of conversations that can and will almost certainly happen. And I think there are ways that Gonzaga to the Big East works for Gonzaga, works for the Big East and works for Fox. I do think that all of that can happen. I just don't think that the media partners are prioritizing that right now and i'm not sure if they ever will which could limit the opportunity for this to actually happen we're going to close out today's show with a fun discussion we had on the locked on zags discord channel about former players coming up right after this all right folks segment three still any patents still locked on zags and we're still going through mailbag monday here but closing out the show with a topic that was brought up on our discord channel again i'll post a link to that in the show notes we got over 60 people there we had a fantasy football draft already we got all sorts of fun stuff going on in the discord channel so check it out uh we have all sorts of good conversations there on the zags and uh, discord user salag 16 brought up the topic of adding a former zag back to the roster i think it was a tweet that was brought up uh, in the college football sphere uh, we kind of talked about it there's a handful of people in this discussion and I kind of wanted to bring it to mailbag instead of just saying like, what if Adam Morrison was on the 2016 team or what if, you know, Dan Dick, was on last year's team or like, whatever I, I want it to be what player in all of Gonzaga basketball history, which player staying an additional year would have been the most impactful to that next year's team. Right. So does that make sense? So I'm going to go through, my five picks, and they're sort of in order, but it's questionable on the exact order. I'm sure people will have other thoughts on this. Five players where if they had stayed one more year, that team could have potentially done even more damage in the NCAA tournament. The number one answer to this, and I just, I, I really have a hard time finding any other answer to this question, Jalen Suggs. If Jalen Suggs were to return after his magnificent freshman season and come back for that 2021-22 team, that team would have been so unbelievably loaded. You would have a backcourt of Jalen Suggs and Andrew Nemhart, which is admittedly the same as the backcourt had been the year previously, but Nemhart would have had a full another year uh, of experience. And of course, we saw what he did in that 21-22 season. So him alongside Suggs would be incredible. You would have Strother and Timmy. Timmy would be starting at the four, and then you'd have Chet Holmgren at the five. Chet and Jalen playing together would have been the ultimate dream just from a college basketball perspective, knowing their fandom, knowing their friendship. Uh, but this team would be would be unbelievable. Rasir Bolton would come off the bench. That'd be the biggest change. You add Jalen Suggs, you bring Nembhard into more of an off-ball role. You add Rasir Bolton as a 10-plus per game bench scorer. I think that team wins it all. I don't think they lose to Arkansas. I think that there's some – the guard depth is better. It's stronger. I just have a hard time seeing that team not doing uh, doing the thing that we want we want a Gonzaga basketball team to do so badly. A team with Chet and Suggs in the starting lineup and NBA players. I mean, I, all five of those guys are NBA players. Every single one of them is. Uh, Timmy is the, the most questionable at this point in terms of if he actually makes it. But that if, if you're – only non-NBA player on your starting lineup is the guy who scored 2,200 points in a Gonzaga uniform. That's a pretty darn good lineup right there. Next up, 
sticking with the same theme, we're going with Chad Holmgren. Chad Holmgren returning for last year's team, coming back on that 22-23 team. And the only reason this one's is lower than Suggs is because he replaces a better player in the starting lineup. No disrespect to Rasir Bolton, but replacing Bolton with Suggs is a really big addition, whereas replacing Chet with – we're replacing Anton Watson with Chet. Now, Wat, Watson would just be a, a dynamic sixth man. You'd have a starting lineup of Chet Holmgren, Drew Timmy, Julian Strother, Rasir Bolton, and Nolan Hickman. So basically last year's starting lineup with Holmgren instead of Watson. You would then have a bench unit of Anton Watson, Malachi Smith, and Hunter Salas as your six, seven, eight tremendous depth on that roster last year's team struggled to defend the rim this was a big issue for them all year long it's something i'm concerned is going to be a big issue for next year's team as well add chet holmgren suddenly zach Eady doesn't do as much damage suddenly adama sonogo doesn't do as much damage you know and i think you, you look at the teams that they played and the games that they lost and there was other issues beyond that but one of the other issues was Guard play, you know, a lot of guards weren't able to get Drew Timmy the basketball, and we struggled there. Chet Holmgren is a player who can handle the basketball. He can be a secondary creator. Like, there's so much that Chet Holmgren adding would add to that roster. Floor spacing on the offensive end, a lob threat, low post scoring, offensive rebounding. Defensively, of course, he's an elite shot blocker, a tremendous rim protector, good in space. Like, the, the addition of Chet Holmgren to last year's roster, pushing Watson into more of a bench role, would have made that team so unbelievably tough to stop. Three more that I want to talk about here. Uh, DeMontis Sabonis, his last season was the 2016-17 season. Imagine if he, or excuse me, his last season was a 15-16 team. Imagine if he had joined that 16-17 and 17 team. And here's the deal. That 2016-17 team, of course, the team that lost to North Carolina in the national championship game, they were set in the front court. Shemek Karnowski started at the five. Jonathan Williams started at the four. They had Zach Collins and Killian Tilly coming off the bench. So it's not like they needed more front court depth. But DeMontis Sabonis is that good. You add DeMontis Sabonis to this team, he starts alongside Shem. Jonathan Williams comes off the bench. Zach Collins is your fourth big. There's a big, huge set of ramifications that happen here. One, Collins probably doesn't become a one and done. He might come back for the following year. Killian Tilly might redshirt. That gives him another year of eligibility. There is a lot of dominoes that would potentially fall had DeMontis Sabonis come back for that 17-18 season. But the biggest one, there's no way they lose to North Carolina in the national championship. Shem can get poked in the eye a thousand times. And if they have DeMontis Sabonis on that roster, they are not losing. They're not losing. It's just not happening. Sabonis was that good. Yeah, he had defensive limitations, but offensively, he was so dang talented and such a force down on the block. I just have a hard time seeing anybody beating that team and barely anybody did when he wasn't there. Imagine what would have happened if he was. Two more to get to today that I'm throwing it back old school. I wanted to get one from a long time ago. Blake Stepp joining the 2004-2005 Zags. He, of course, finished his career in that 03 or 04 season. But if you bring Blake Stepp back for 2004-2005, that was a three seed that lost to a six seed in Texas Tech in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Blake Stepp would replace Errol Knight in the starting lineup. You'd have a starting lineup of Derek Rivio, Blake Stepp, a younger Adam Morrison, Roni Turioff, and J.P. Batista with Errol Knight coming off the bench, with Sean Mallon coming off the bench. There was still some depth issues behind them, so it's probably a seven-man rotation. Pendergraf is kind of that eighth guy on that team at that point. But man. Rivio and Step would have been an incredible backcourt there. Errol Knight as the third guard is fantastic. Step would be a, a better scorer. He'd be a floor spacer, a distributor. I, I just think that, that would have really helped that team. I don't think they lose to Texas Tech with a veteran Blake Step on that roster. Final one, and this is kind of a unique one. I was trying to find another boost that I thought would really give a team a chance to actually make a, a much bigger run. And while Jonathan Williams is certainly not an all-time iconic zag the way that most of the rest of these players are, if you add J Jonathan Williams to that 2018-19 team, I think you, you change the conversation significantly. The starting lineup doesn't even change. Brandon Clark at the five, Rui Hachimura at the four, Corey Kispert at the three, Zach Norvell and Josh Perkins in the backcourt. That starting lineup doesn't change. But now you add Jonathan Williams to the bench that already had Philip Petrusev, that already had Killian Tilly, that already had Gino Crandall, Jeremy Jones, and Joel Eiei. Man, what a deep, dominant roster that would be. That team also suffered when Killian Tilly dealt with injuries. Imagine adding Jonathan Williams. Low post scorer, a bit of a floor spacer, hard-nosed rebounder, tenacious defender. Putting him on a roster where... When, when when either Brandon Clark or Rui Hachimura come off the game, the other team's like, oh, thank gosh, 
they'll go to their bench. We're going to be okay. And you bring in Jonathan Williams, <laughs> man, that would have been absolutely ridiculous. I know Williams is not the name that Adam Morrison is or the name that Dan Dickow is or the name that insert any other very iconic zag that I did not pick for this exercise. But adding Jonathan Williams to that 18-19 team, I think could potentially put that team in the Elite Eight Final Four and heck, potentially even in to the national championship game. Well, folks, that's going to wrap us up for today. I love Mailbag Monday. Very excited to get a chance to bring this back. Looking forward to some more fun stuff later this week as well. We'll keep talking conference realignment. We'll keep talking about the new players on Gonzaga's roster. We'll get some guests on the show as well. All right here on the Locked on Zags podcast. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Also available on YouTube as well. Go hit that subscribe button. We're trying to get to 2,000. We are awfully close to 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. So go subscribe if you have not done so yet. Hit that link to go join us on the Discord channel as well. Always love having new faces to chat with on a daily basis uh, on the Discord channel. So go ahead and do that if you have not done so yet. Thank you all for listening. And of course, until next time, as always, go Zags.